that. All right, cool. Hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout, the last one of the year <laughs> for December 27th, 2013. And joining me this week, we've got Brian Koberlein from Rochester Institute of Technology. Hey, Brian. Hello. Haven't seen you in a while. It's awesome. Yep. Got Dave Dickinson, a.k.a. Hey, hey. Astro Guys. Today he Another is a metals-based <laughs> life form. <laughs> metals in the, the astronomical sense, as in not hydrogen or helium-based. So. so you're not full of pot air. Exactly. Or uh, intelligence shade of the color blue or anything like that, no. So. <laughs> and my Astronomy Cast co-host, Dr. Pamela Gay. Hey, Pamela. Hey. It's been a while since you had you. This is great. So we've got sort of two agendas today. Uh, since there's not a lot of big space news happening over the course of this uh, of this last week, so we've got two things. One, we're going to do sort of a mini year in review. We're going to talk about a lot of the big stories that we really felt were important over the course of this year. And then two, we're going to talk about what's coming up. And Dave Dickinson has made a gigantic 101 uh, things you should be watching for in 2014. So a bit of a preview, and he's going to sort of run through some of the highlights, and we will talk about some of the things that we're most interested in and excited about. So uh, so let's, let's kind of... Let's kind of go through this. Now, before we kind of move through the big list, I want to remind you that this is an interactive experience. So if you want to talk to us, you absolutely can. Uh, there's a few ways to do it. Probably the best way now is to use the Q&A app, which I have enabled for this episode of the Space Hangout. So uh, hopefully, wherever you're seeing this, if you're seeing this on YouTube, if you're seeing this on Google+, if you're seeing this embedded somewhere on Universe Today, you should be able to access the Q&A app and you can post some questions that you have or any comments that you might want to make to the panel. You can vote up the ones that you like, so, so that's pretty cool. There's other places as well. Uh, you can comment over on YouTube. You can comment on the event page on Google+. Man, this gets so complicated. I know. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Just use the Q&A app. Uh, you can also uh, send a tweet. I don't know what Space Hangout was that. The uh, WSH. WSH. Use the hashtag WSH. I know Pamela is watching that. So, um, but we we'd be glad to sort of hear you know. And, and seriously, if there's something that we didn't think was a big story of the year and you think it is, pop it in the question in the Q&A, and then I will sort of incorporate that into the show. So, that is uh, that's the housekeeping out of order. All right, so let's uh, let's roll. So here, let's talk about some of the big events. So what do you what do you guys think was the biggest biggest event of the of the year? The only think? event that got me out of bed was the Chelyabinsk meteor. But I be I believe you got me out of bed as yes. well. Yeah, you actually. I think it's like I think you <laughs> called me on the phone, sent me a text. It's very yeah. rare that we actually yeah. communicate in anything that isn't just like an email <laughs> in prep for the show. But you actually sent me a text message like, "Hey, are you up? Something's happening in Russia." <laughs> that 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 happened that happened the day after Valentine's Day, and me and the wife just totally disconnected from the cyber world. Oh so I no! Till that very next morning when I woke up, and the the first ones I saw, I thought, it's just your standard somebody saw a meteor, and then after I started seeing it, like, uh, uh, across Yahoo and all these other news networks, I realized it's really something big. So, uh, and Brian, where were you when Chelyabinsk happened? Um, I was in class, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I but it was, like, in the Houston. middle of the night. It was night. the middle of the night, right? But, but yeah. I didn't hear about it until the next morning. Oh. I, yeah, I, it was I, the same way. I didn't, oh, most of us on the hear East about Coast... This? Okay. Yeah, most of us on the East Coast didn't hear about it till the, yeah. the morning of the 15th. Yeah, I, I got a text message from noisy astronomer Nicole Gulucci, and she's like, something just happened in Russia, get out of bed. And I went instantly awake because there was no, like, meteor mentioned. It was just, you need to get out of bed because something happened in Russia, and that was definitely a more words were needed text. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it some so, kind of launch? Some kind of yeah, launch? <laughs> or or did it just like implode? I don't know. Um, so so there's a I, fireball in Russia. Right, right. Yeah. So so I hit Twitter, and that's what I see is fireball in Russia. It's like I uh, huh? Okay, getting out of bed now. And what's cool is I speak Russian very badly. And so I'm watching all of the videos that were getting posted on YouTube, and I'm just giggling because the Russians are so nonplussed about the entire thing. They're like, oh, <laughs> there's a light, and they just keep yeah. driving, and it was awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, and we really, I mean, we learned a bunch of things, right? We learned about a bit more about how 
big these objects can actually get and still detonate in the in the air. I think that was surprising how large this object ended up being. And we also learned just how many of these Russians have these dash cams. <laughs> like, nothing goes unseen in Russia now when yeah, you have right. all dash cams going. Yeah. You, you, you could almost see the string of events because it was the dash cams that caught all the video of the meteor. Right. Then everybody ran out with their cell phones and they caught the, the sound wave and the blast when it hit them. So you could kind of see the sequence of events going on that day as it happened. And, and it let us see how much power comes from sound waves. All those windows yeah. getting blasted out. That yeah, was, was really surprising to well, me. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. You could just imagine. I'm like, I just imagine the situation that just got played out thousands of times where a person sees this bright flash. Their whole room, because it's sort of in the morning in Russia, kind of yeah. dark. The whole room gets illuminated. And they're, they're like, what? And they walk over, right? And they stand in front of their window and they look around, and they look, oh, <laughs> and then they see this this white plume in the sky. And they're like, what is that about? I don't know. And, and they're like looking around, they're going to call, and, boom, <laughs> and then all their <laughs> windows shred and, and right in their faces, yeah. And, and remember oh. that, that day, asteroid DA-14 uh, uh, was already coming by that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so and and I've heard that there may be some ideas that those two objects were actually connected. Like no. No? Not, okay. No. They, they were radically totally different, different trajectories. Totally different yeah. trajectories? Okay, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. I strike that from the record, please. So <laughs> have we learned anything that. new from, you know, since we reported, we went, you know, we dedicated a whole show to the story. Have we learned anything new since since then? Meteorites we are fragile? Big, yeah. We have, a, we have a big blind spot toward the sun that we don't see things coming. <laughs> and they did I, find the, uh, they did find some of the... I guess some of the meteorites that came down as a stony meteorite, they found it in a lake, um, and they've been doing some analysis, but I don't think anything interesting has come out of it. I, I expect that at the March Lunar and Planetary Society conference we'll hear more, uh, but, but what really caught me was the rock, the surviving meteorite stayed fairly intact after it ended up in the bottom of this lake, and they pull it out and it just crumbled into pieces. Yeah. And it's just sort of oh, like wow. these things are fragile and can yet destroy all the windows in a city. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, just a, an amazing story. And it was it was interesting to see how much the government leapt into action and convened meetings. And I know Ed Liu and Rusty Schweikert from the B612 Foundation were busy fielding phone calls. And then I don't know if anything went anywhere. We we were lucky it came in at a very oblique angle too. Yeah. If yeah. it had been at a, a steeper angle, it would have been a lot more damage. I was amazed no one was people were injured, but nobody was killed. That was really lucky. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's I think that was the big story. And uh, but that's I think the next big story was a lot more disappointing. And this was your beat, David, which was Comet oh, Ison. Com <laughs> Got to be Comet Ison. Yeah, we didn't have our Comet of the Century, unfortunately. It's. Uh, Comet Ison went toward that other end of the spectrum and decided that it just wasn't going to perform after Perihelion. It broke up and fell apart. So, But it was fun watching it during Perihelion that day, <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day, when we were all sitting there in between Thanksgiving dinner trying to watch what was going on on, on SDO and SOHO and, and everything else. And we had a lot of, we actually had a few good comets this year. Uh, we had Comet L4 Panstars this spring. We had Comet Lemon. Uh, we have Comet R1 Lovejoy right now that's still uh, performing. So, but we didn't get the big uh, hail bop type comet that we were hoping for. Well, for a while there, there was like five. Was there five comets visible in the sky with binoculars? Like it really yeah. was a year of the comets. There was this fall. Yeah, this fall there there was a bunch. There was a few that actually went into Comet Novetsky went into outburst. Uh, there was one of the Comet Linears went into outburst. So yeah, we we had a few good binocular comets. We just didn't. Uh, you know, I was thinking this morning I could count on one hand the number of times I actually saw Comet Ison uh, with binoculars or the naked eye before it went to perihelion. So I didn't. We didn't get many good looks at it, unfortunately. And, and what gets me is the history of how this came to be known as the Comet of the Century. <laughs> it, it was originally, they thought that it had the same orbit as the Great Comet of 1680. It had a similar yeah. orbit, and so there was hope that this was related to the Great Comet of 1680, which was like daytime visible, looked like a tail coming off the sun. And 
once it got the the press for being a potential comet of the century, everyone just went with it. So even after we realized not related, even after we realized kind of smaller than anticipated, um, people kept going with the "It's going to be the comet." No, <laughs> just no. Ah la 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 la! It's going to be the comet <laughs> of the century. I almost like comets like Hayukutaki that just come up out of nowhere, and within yeah. weeks they're bright comets. They, they they don't have the time to have that lead up to the big uh, hype. You know, they just come up and they're bright all of a sudden. So. Now, now, Brian, did you get a chance to do any observing this year? Not a whole lot. Not this year. Yeah, yeah. So, I, it was a pretty terrible weather here. Although we we haven't had rain, but we just it's just been clouds, clouds, clouds. But that's you know winter on the west coast. Yeah, for yeah. Us. it's same here in Rochester. But and David even you know David is dedicated and he didn't have the best observing conditions either. So no, we didn't. It was pretty cloudy down here most of the fall. So yeah. Um, well, so there you go. So I, I've said this before, and I will say this again, is that the universe owes me a comet. <laughs> I, the I universe would... owes you nothing. No, it's trying no. to kill you. I know it's trying to kill me, but if I can have a comet first, that would be great. You know, you know Comet Ison's closest approach would have been yesterday, as a matter of fact, was when it was due its closest approach to Earth. Yeah. Now, are we going to... I've heard as well that we're going to interact maybe with the tail. There might be a meteor shower. Is there any... There's there's some ideas January 10th into the middle of January that we may have a minor meteor shower, but the you know the Quaternid meteors pick up next month too, so I don't know how dis predicting those kind of meteor showers that aren't annual is really kind of a, a guessing game. So we'll just have to wait and see if we get any. And, and we're just talking dust particles. We're not going to get like fragments hailing down or anything like that. So Mark Tatter says uh, I'm currently selling T-shirts that say Comet Ison sucks. <laughs> yeah, I'll take one. Um, they always come in pairs, so we're due. We are due. We are due. We had Hale Bop and Hakataki. They always seem to come in pairs. Yeah, it's time. It's yeah. time. <sighs> All right, let's move on. Voyager left the solar system. Yes. Like, or did it? No. It depends on what you mean. Again. <laughs> so I know, Brian, you, the you, you've <laughs> reported on this quite a bit, right, on your right. on your blog. So what happened? Uh, Voyager crossed what's known as a heliopause. That's where the uh, solar wind kind of stops. It reaches its uh, end of pressure, and you enter kind of the interstellar wind uh, from the larger stars. But but it's still got a long way to go to the Oort cloud or anything else. You know, I mean, it's made it a long way, but it hasn't gone that far. So so unfortunately, some people have said that's you know the edge of the solar system, but it's not really. It's the edge of um, the magnetic Where the solar wind influence. Is. Yeah, yeah, the magnetic influence of the sun. Right, and so now it's getting bombarded by the interstellar winds from the other stars. Right. But it's still, it's a fraction. It's not even, you know, through the Kuiper belt, right? Right, no, not even close. I, think it's I believe a, it's 125 AU, I think. Yeah, 125 AU. And, so that and, does put yeah. it beyond the edge of the Kuiper belt, because the Kuiper belt has that right. cliff. But it's still well inside of the Oort cloud. Yeah. The Oort cloud is like 10,000 AU, right? 10,000, 50,000, something like that. Yeah. So it's, and it, you know, it will literally be traveling for 30,000 years before it leaves the gravitational influence of the, of the sun and gets into something else's gravitational influence. I mean, it's, right. it's a long time. A long time. <laughs> Do you think the RTG will hold out? I think so. I think it's yeah. still. I think they're saying till 2020 at least. I mean, they got what a plutonium's 70 something year half life, something like that. 70 to 80, yeah. I think. What What I love is it's now 17 light hours away. Yeah. We We can measure the distance in light hours. Um, that's yeah. kind of awesome. And it's it's using eight track technology too. Yeah. So, <laughs> literally. <laughs> right. Hey, never get rid of your magnetic tape. It's the only thing <laughs> yeah. that's going to survive. And and so, I mean, how are the transmitters doing on it? Like, it's still at 17 hours away. We're still able to to pick up a signal from it. Yeah. And yeah. still able to communicate and give it orders. And these RTGs are amazing. They, you know, it's too bad they're maybe not going to make more of them. Yeah, we reported on that this year too. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't we segue then into some really depressing news? And normally, we bring Casey <laughs> from the Planetary Society in to to give us the bad news, but Pamela can do that as well because it really impacted her personally. So oh, the government oh, yeah. just we had so we had the government shut down and all of the 
financing problems that that happened this year. So so what happened, Pamela? Well, it it was a double-edged sword of of death. Um, the the first thing that affected us was government sequ sequestration, which was across the board cuts to every organization in the U.S. government, and NASA has a lot of budgets it just can't cut. Spacecrafts have a finite cost to maintain. Uh, facilities have a finite cost. International Space Station has a finite cost. And so when they had to find something to cut, well, the first things to go were uh, funding for education, public outreach, new programs, and travel and conferences. So we saw the ability of researchers to apply for new monies for new programs go away. We saw existing programs get cut. We saw uh, layoffs at some places. And I was on one rather te terrifying te telecon where one woman asked, so should I start looking for a new job when we were talking about funding in uh, education, communications, and public outreach. And there was a rather lengthy going nowhere response that boiled down to, I don't want to say yes, but yes. And then we had on the National Science Foundation side, um, they again, they have finite things that have to be paid for, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, ALMA, uh, these big programs coming line, keeping existing telescopes going. It looked for a while like Green Bank's telescope was going to get cut. Um, and again, we saw cuts to major uh, ways that we can apply for new funding. And the thing that I'm looking at the most painfully is the National Science Foundation is starting to more strictly enforce their guideline that people like me should only ask for two months of salary per year. I'm not sure where the other 10 months of salary are coming from right now because NASA's canceled all of my programs. And National Science Foundation for some programs we're looking at 8% will get funded. Um, in planetary science going into 2014 we're looking at 30% of the new calls for funding going away. And what that means is 30% of the people who were relying on that will probably go away. We are at a stage where word from on high as in Congress and the bureaucrats is we won the space race. It's time to send all the researchers who aren't teaching faculty home and they're setting up guidelines that two months a year that's your summer salary when you're a teaching professor. Mm -hmm. So all those people mm -hmm. working at places like Southwest Research Institute at the Planetary Society, the Planetary Science Institute, at all of these non-teaching institutions and all of the people like me who made the choice to dedicate our time to running research programs. Well, they're legislating laying us all off and so we have to find alternative funding. And this is where you've seen me putting out calls to donate to CosmoQuest.org. Um, we are an organization that works to keep our researchers going through donations and to find ways to cut the costs on doing science by looking for volunteers. It's hard, but we're trying to keep things going. So I mean, the the government shutdown was particularly hard on NASA yeah. because there was like, I think it was pretty much the highest shutdown part of the entire government. There was like 97, one point, or 97% of NASA employees were part of that shutdown. And yeah, we're not allowed to work. Well, it, it's because we're considered non-essential. Yeah, and so literally it was just some people working on the MSL to make sure that it was still moving. And I think Maven. the, the uh, yeah the yeah. Maven launch yeah, kept Maven moving forward. The there was the um, the astronauts up yeah <laughs> that were on the space station at that time. So. Um, but it's weird. I mean, you know, on if you look at it purely from NASA and from purely from the NSF, then it feels like that we're in very dark times for all of astronomy. And yet there is this, I mean, you mentioned this kind of double-edged sword. There's, there's this sort of this other side of it, which is all the stuff that's happening in the private and also with the Chinese. So, so why don't we sort of segue, which was the, all of the advancements that happened with SpaceX this year. Right. Um, SpaceX was the first uh, private company to deliver 
to the, the space ISS. station this year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they they were the first to do a commercial launch of satellites. Yep. And and here what we're looking at is if you need a cargo truck, SpaceX has it. Yeah. If you need to pay your scientists sitting on the planet Earth, we're kind of out of luck. But yeah. if you need to get stuff into space, we can get it into space and then not pay for anyone to do anything with the data. Or, right. or but hopefully, science. you know, decreasing the launch costs will have some benefits on uh, on planetary science over over time. We hope. So Orb orbital orbital science has got into the game too. They're launching out of wallops now, going up to the ISS as well this year. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was the amazing uh, the grasshopper tests. Yes. Right with this with this with the uh, the frightened cows. Next year we might see the Falcon 9 Heavy finally test too. I was I was looking ahead to what stories might be coming up, and and that's one in 2014. We may finally, along with the Orion capsule, may finally get its uh, flight as well. I was fortunate enough to uh, to actually visit SpaceX this year, and uh, and it was an amazing place. I mean, it's just a real sense of that they're moving forward and that this is serious, and. And what's amazing is how they're all like, we're going to Mars. Like, we're absolutely going to Mars. Mars is the plan. And, uh, and so I think, I think a lot of people were fairly suspicious of Elon Musk's intentions. Like, is he just there? Is he just going to try and make money? No, no, no. He wants to send humans to Mars. No it, question. It, it's this amazing time where you look at Spaceship Two had its first powered uh, flight. Uh, we're looking towards potential actual space tourists going up next year, and and so it feels very much like the great uh, West Indian trading company of the future <laughs> is coming into existence, where the oceans aren't uh, the oceans of space. In this case, are going to be filled with the commercial craft that are carrying the new colonists and carrying goods and bringing back the minerals and other natural resources of, well, the other side of the great beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and then not just the Americans and not just SpaceX is in the game. There's a tremendous accomplishment from the Chinese uh, this month, still sort of fresh in our mind, which is the, uh, the Chang E3 lander dropping down onto the, uh, onto the moon. Did you uh, did you guys get a chance to watch some of that stuff live? Yeah, I watched I watched that I watched that live a few Saturday yeah. nights ago. That was kind of cool. And it, it's and it's strange to see the moon behind a rover again instead of Mars. Like I said, I always have to yeah. tell myself it's not Mars now because we're just used to seeing that Mars scape behind any rover. That it's it's been a long time since we've been back to the surface of the moon since 1976 when yeah. when the Russians landed their last rover. So it's uh, and that rover, incidentally, it just experienced its first uh, lunar sunset for the next two weeks. So they they powered it down for a bit. Uh, but yeah, it's an amazing accomplishment by the Chinese. Uh, they they've sent a few orbiters uh, around and past the moon, but this is the first time they've landed something on the moon. So it's, it's kind of cool to watch what they're and they they really had a lot of unprecedented access to what they showed because uh, a lot of their missions tend to happen like the old Cold War missions where yeah. we just hear there's a launch mm -hmm. but we don't see anything. This time, and when they did the Tiangong missions to their space station, we're getting to participate a little more. What we're used to now with, with the internet and everything. Yeah. And with the Laddie mission, they actually got great data on how oh, cool. a spacecraft landing affects the, the atmosphere of the moon. And it wasn't just China jumping into the game. We also had the Indian Mars orbiter, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Mangalayan, um, launched as well. So... India is on its way to Mars, so it's yeah. it's now uh, there's new players at the table. Brian, what do you think is going to be happening with the sort of with the Chinese space program from here on out? What do you sort of what do you um, anticipate? I think they're very tenacious. I think I think we're going to see this more and more and more. Um, I think gradually the United States may realize that you know they have a serious competitor now, and and I think that's something that we haven't realized yet. You know, particularly with the sequester and the cutbacks. You know, there's when um, when gravity came out, there was a lot of discussion where, you know, people that I had hung out with says China has a space station. That's that's science fiction, right? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, they, they do. really do have a space station, and people yeah. don't realize that. You know, I think the lander was another thing where people, China has a lander. Yeah, they've been doing this for a while. You know, and and. I think we're going to see that now that they've opened up too. They've they've got more in the media. I think we're going to see more of that. And I think it's hopefully it will kind of wake us up to the idea that you know 
space exploration is moving forward, it doesn't necessarily have to be us, the United States. It got do you think so the crap. next? Do you think the next humans to set foot on the moon will be the Chinese? I think it could be. I think it, yeah. it really depends on what we do. Um, I think they will. They will get to the moon. They will get humans on the moon. Um, the question is I whether or not from we do as well. I keep hearing from different sources that uh, Tiangong One may be deorbited. They kept saying by the end of 2013, and we're at the end of 2013 now. So, but it's. Uh, I think they're going to deorbit it very soon. The manned missions, crewed missions to it, are, are over with. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's let's uh, shift gears now and talk about some of the interesting planetary science discoveries that were made this made this year. And I think uh, I think one of the most exciting and sort of surprising ones was the discovery that there were plumes on Europa, similar to uh, what we've known about on uh, on Enceladus. Mm -hmm. And uh, David, were you, you covering this? Were you following I, this one? I, saw, I, I I read some of it. I was kind of on the sidelines of that, but that is kind of an amazing discovery. And I, the takeaway when when I when I first very first saw that, whenever I see something about Jupiter, I start thinking, wait a minute, we don't have anything orbiting Jupiter, so where is this data coming from? But apparently, I believe it was from Hubble data from observations yep. of Europa. And there was and, also some Galileo data, wasn't there? I'm trying to think. Yeah, there was. Of course, Galileo was deorbited over a decade ago, but it's. Uh, one takeaway thing from this is looking at it, you think, well, one thing we wonder about is how thick those ice sheets are, because Europa is on the short list of anywhere there could possibly be anything interesting chemically going on, and there possibly could be light elsewhere in our solar system. So we definitely want to get out there and take a look, but the, one of the engineering problems is how do you get through if it's kilometers thick? That's a very, that's a non-trivial issue of how to get down to that European ocean, but if it's if it's fracturing and, and jetting out water periodically, there may be things lying on the surface there just for us to go and, and see and, and look at. So that uh, might put some impetus behind NASA or ESA to actually send a spacecraft to Europa, to just a targeted Europa mission is something they've wanted to do for some time. Yeah, I, mean, I wonder, you know, could you, if you, we were talking about this before, like could you put, send like a Stardust mission through these plumes and collect some of the particles and then bring them back to Earth and study them and could you maybe find organics in there? Could you find even, you know, bacterial one, evidence? One problem with Europa is it gets exposed, like EO, uh, closer into Jupiter, it gets exposed to a lot of radiation. Like the Juno mission that's going there in 2016 will go nowhere near that inner part of the of the Jehovan system there, so it's uh, it's definitely would be a problem to uh, to explore. There was a good movie on uh, Europa Report came out this summer that was actually pretty decent uh, about uh, possibilities of sending a manned mission to Europa. I still haven't seen it. Have you guys seen it? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I rented it online on Amazon Prime. So it, it was an independent release, so it didn't make it to a lot of theaters, but I did watch it online. It was kind of cool. Cool. Um... All right, so let's move on. Uh, what else have we got? All oh, right, so there was the other part, which was the uh, the photograph that Cassini took of the whole of Saturn and included the the Earth. And this is sort of the, the recreation of the pale blue dot. It was the day that that the Earth smiled at Cassini. Okay. And uh, so, do who? Uh, uh, Pamela, were you? Uh, did you get, take a picture of yourself for that? So, so I have to admit, uh, I, I was over in Portugal at the time, and we were all like, "Okay, we need to remember." And then we went out for dinner, and when dinner was over, we were like, "Oh crud, we <laughs> missed it." But I mean, it's it it's a neat idea to get the whole world realizing that we really are nothing more than a small blip in the enormity of space. And I think the images coming back and continuing to get posted, and Astronomers Without Borders uh, was really neat because they had people take pictures of themselves and then they mosaiced that together into a picture of Saturn. So you have Saturn taking a picture of the Earth and then the Earth taking pictures of themselves and making Saturn. And that was just a neat mirror of looking at it. This this was the first time we all knew in advance they were going to do yeah. a blue, blue, pale blue yeah. dot picture. So. Yeah. Let's see if I can get a picture up. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we mentioned that I think they really did a good job of just handling the media on this. Like, they were, they did a great job of letting people know that this was going to be happening. They gave people the exact time and date, and then they took the picture, and then you got to see some rough versions of the picture, and then a final version of the picture, which was, of course, just absolutely stunning. 
Um, here we go. Let me see if they did a big mosaic of everybody uh, on the planet Earth too, uh, where you zoomed in and you could see everybody's photo like pixelated. Yeah, on the, that was the, the Astronomers Without Borders. Yeah, that yeah. was cool. All right here, I got the picture here. All right, so I don't know if you guys can see this. Is that working? Yeah. If I could change the astrophoto ratio a bit on I, here. I was, I was surprised they could resolve the moon. That was kind of cool. Yeah, that one yeah, surprised me yeah, too. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, that's good. And I, I mean, I think I hope that that NASA and you know other agencies have really got a sense that. I know I'm just a talking Saturn right now. Um, I hope they've got a real sense that that the public is really excited and open to this kind of communication and being involved, and you know they they are really really interested in what's going on. And I think another classic example of this was all the stuff that Chris Hadfield did on the International Space Station this year. He really demonstrated what it was you know what an astronaut could do in communicating science, in interacting with the public, in kind of being creative and quirky and and musical and, you know, and I, I think it's maybe it's because he was Canadian that he didn't have this <laughs> kind of restrictions. No, you know? that's true. Well, yeah, they, no, they did say that. They said that he wasn't, he didn't have a lot of the same restrictions that NASA astronauts would have had that yeah. enabled him to do the space oddity video and the things like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I think, you know, Chris Hadfield was one of the, I mean, sort of one of the best, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but he was like one of the, just a great example of an astronaut, the kind of person who can be an astronaut, that that he was both super smart, test pilot, technically competent, but also super creative and really willing to reach out to the public and, and help us, you know, share in the experience. I got to talk to him, which was awesome. So, uh, yeah. The, no, the, na the nature, the nature of things. The Canadian show did an awesome uh, special on him, and Elizabeth Howell from Universe Today, she was actually in that too. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. We need more Canadians in space. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteer. Uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, I think I'm I'm almost running out. I know we want to. We need to switch to sort of what's coming up. So uh, the. It, continuing the planetary conversation, which was sort of all of the work done by Curiosity this year. And, of course, it launched back in 2012, landed on on Mars, but it made some of its bigger discoveries this year as it really got, got moving. Uh, now, who, so, I don't know, Brian, were you following some of the Curiosity stuff? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. I got, I got it all kind of secondhand because it's kind of outside my field. I kind of I kind of liked it. And it wasn't really well. They they had a little bit of science involved in it, but they got some awesome uh, transits of Mars's moons yes. in, fr in front of yeah. the sun. I thought those were kind of cool. I did write on those, and they did use those to uh, try to pinpoint Curiosity's position uh, to try to refine its exact position in the it, to refine the orbits of the moons as well. So there was some science out of that, other than just being a pretty picture. But from an amateur astronomer's standpoint, I always think of what it would look like being on Mars to do astronomy. So I thought that was kind of cool they released those photos. I mean, one of the really big discoveries was, was that they found conglomerate rocks on the surface yes. of, of right. Mars. And so these are these, these you know, rocks all... Uh, sort of cemented together in sand and silt, and then they, they fall apart. And you only get those kinds of rocks when you've had a river flowing for a long time, and the rocks can tumble up and jumble up, and then they sort of end up in some basin, and then silt gets on top of them, and it gets compacted down, and they get turned into these conglomerate rocks. we got, you know, tons of them around where I live. Um, and that tells you that water was acting, liquid water was acting on the surface of Mars for long periods of time. And this was, this was sort of Really, this was the thing that Curiosity was looking for. Was there conditions for life in the ancient past on Mars? And this was the smoking gun. There absolutely was the conditions. So, so really, can, you know, Curiosity has fulfilled its major mission goal, which is to, to seek out this. Now it's just a matter of finding more evidence, different evidence, try to continue fine-tuning what it's looking for. So it was, a, it was a terrific series of discoveries from Curiosity. Um, right. Okay. So one last, I guess, one last story, which I think was a big story last year, which was the, uh, which was Kepler. Eh. So we, you know, we eh. we found lots of extrasolar <laughs> planets and we lost Kepler. Yeah, and just at the stage when it was starting 
to be primed for finding Earth-sized things. Because yeah. it, it takes time for it. It has to catch three transits before they're yeah. willing to say, yes, there's a planet. And it was just hitting its year three. And, and so that means anything that it caught right off the bat, well, it's going to take time in some cases where you get unlucky and it starts looking the day after the transit or something worse. Mm -hmm. um, it takes time to add up all of those cycles. And just as it was hitting prime time, it borked. Yep. And why did it go bad? <laughs> what could it possibly have been? What went wrong? I don't what, know. What, what might know. it have been, Fraser? Reactor wheels is what went <laughs> wrong. <sighs> no one listens to me. More what reaction wheels. What always goes wrong? Yeah. I, I, I think uh, I read recently there's about 3,500 uh, unconfirmed exoplanets still in the pipeline from Kepler. We just passed 1,000 yeah. confirmed this yeah. year. So uh, there's – and TESS is going up in a couple of years. That's going to be the next generation exoplanet satellite, so – so uh, we may pass 10,000 by 2020. That's that's a big news because we're now, you know, the number of planets that we know of that are confirmed are on the order of 1,000 now. And, and researchers out yeah, at the well, Center for Astrophysics are suggesting that statistically one in six stars should have an Earth-sized planet. And it's looking like the vast majority of stars have planets. Yeah, I was really expecting us to find that other Earth analog this year. Like the the Earth-sized planet located within the habitable zone of its star, and that didn't that didn't turn up. I was Reaction just... wheels. I know. <laughs> but maybe no. But I mean, it's probably in the data. I mean, I'm sure that that Earth-sized planet is in the data, and I'll bet you, people working with Kepler have a few candidates that they would like to get confirmed better, and they're going to come back around and use some other method to really confirm their data. But I'll I'll bet you they have Although... it in there. Although it's not an exoplanet hunter, Gaia may well find m many more exoplanets as well. There's yeah, all yeah. more in the data. So. Yeah, and so this was another big story. I mean, we haven't really seen the payoff yet, but but uh, the Gaia, the Europeans Gaia spacecraft launched just just a couple of weeks ago, and I mean, when you really wrap your head around what this spacecraft is going to do, it's going to map out like one percent of the entire galaxy. It's gonna it's gonna find mi like a million. Was it a 10 million stars? I mean, millions of stars. It's going to be, it's going to create a 3D map of a gigantic portion of the galaxy from our perspective. It's, a, it's going to be amazing. So, and confirm a whole bunch of other amazing kinds of scientific discoveries as well. It's going to confirm Einstein. It's going to be looking for exoplanets. Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's finding amazing. asteroids. When, it's going to be doing all yeah, kinds when of you, stuff. When you read about all the spin-off science they're expecting, like you said, with asteroids and comets and exoplanets, and it's, there's going to be a lot of uh, even variable stars and astroseismology, and there's, there's a lot of spin-off science that's going to come well, out of this. Well, between thing. that and LSST, we're looking to move into a whole new level of statistically significant studies where right. we're, we're going to go from having a couple dozen examples to a cousin, couple tens of thousands of examples. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think those are all the big stories that, uh, that no, we had. No, no, you're no, forgetting you the best image of the <laughs> entire <laughs> year. You got it. Space frog. Space frog. <laughs> <laughs> go Space frog. frog. I, I, I'm pretty sure Jason Major was the one that broke this to the world when he when he because Nancy had it for a while before she had to, she had to verify it. I remember. Yeah, her so I, here I'll t I can tell you the story, um, which was uh, after the picture got taken, uh, it was sort of hidden away on one of NASA's servers and. People, no, NASA wasn't publishing anything about it, and then uh, somebody reached out and uh, posted it on Reddit, I think. And yeah, yeah. yeah, posted on Reddit. Someone had dug through and found it and posted it on Reddit. And then I think I found it on someone had, had emailed me and said, "Check out this picture." And then I fired it off to Nancy and said, "Do you think this is real?" And she goes, "I don't know. Let me talk to NASA." <laughs> and then so she had her story ready. Talk to talking about like what was going on, and then we waited for a couple of days to get a confirmation from NASA, and then, and then they got back to us and said, yeah, indeed it is, and 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 then <laughs> and then we, uh, you know, so then we posted a story on it, and then NASA after that sort of updated their server and actually, you know, provided some press information on the on the frog, and and it was good. I mean, I think I can see why originally they were not super keen to post a lot of information about it because that frog is dead. Yes. <laughs> 
That is a dead frog. Well, it's it's like the bat that was caught a couple of years yeah. ago on one of the the yeah. solid rocket engines and yeah. But I have to say, this is my favorite space-related image of the year. I can't say why. It's just, it is. It's this emotional. That's mm -hmm. awesome. But then the Jason went on. To, yeah, Jason went on to find all kinds of stuff. He found space armadillos, and there was yeah. For mm -hmm. once, you start looking for animals and launches. They're everywhere, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, and there's space bat, and there's uh, and then there was the cows being uh, harassed by the grasshopper. <laughs> that was cool the video. I saw that was cool. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. So so just there is an effect on the animals in the uh, in the space flight <laughs> industry. So good. No, totally agree, Pamela. Like, that's a great picture. So, th so that's it. You know what? That was a great year for space and astronomy for 2013. Now let's move on to the future, and we've got about uh, maybe about 12 more minutes left, and. Uh, and also I'm going to want to answer some questions. So before we move on, actually, let's let's get some questions going here. Uh, wow, Dave, your article is bogging down my computer trying to open it up. It's uh -oh. so lengthy. Yeah, it's, I, I tried to curb it. I tried to curb it at 3,000 words. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, um, it, oh, so just to, related to the... the uh, uh, the Chelyabinsk meteor, uh, Mark Tatter asks, if that thing had come straight down and impacted the Earth, what would have happened? Tunguska? Tunguska. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I, I think it was smaller than Tunguska, but it, it would have been still not good, especially you over could, a major you city. Could knock out a pretty big town with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian Hudson says the, the anticlimax of the year was Ison. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, Todd Weller says, speaking of rovers, how worried should we be about the Curiosity's wheel damage? That is unclear right now. Um, they they did discover it's not so much weird wheel damage as one of the wheels is re wearing down faster than um, it was anticipated, and they can see this in its ability to roll and other sensor data. Um, it's telling us that the Mars surface is gnarlier than anticipated and we knew this a little bit from uh, Opportunity which now has one of its wheels up. Um, Mars is a rough place, sand is nasty, dust is nasty, but she's still going. Um, so Guido Bibra notes that right now the ISS spacewalk is still going where they're, they're attaching the new HD yeah. Earth camera. So yeah. this is the uh, this is the Earth cam, and actually they're a Vancouver-based company. Yeah, I was just watching that before we got over to the space hangout. I was watching that most yeah. of the day. That is so cool. Kind of cool. Um, all right, so let's see. Is there anything else? Um, any other questions here? Hmm. Daniel Yount says, I had read that laser gyros can replace mechanical gyros with the mass of the photons shifting the weight. It's it's not quite enough momentum yet for big spacecraft. But you, you, you could use solar power to fire lasers and the laser would generate a little bit of momentum. If you have something really tiny. Yeah. We're talking like smaller than a can sat right now. Yeah. Neat. There were a lot of cube sets deployed this year, and phone sets too. So. Yeah. Uh, Christine Grosvenor says that the Europe report is streaming on Netflix now. So there you go. Oh, cool. very cool. I'll I'm have to sure. go see it, go watch it again. I'm sure only for the United States. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, that's a bunch of the big questions. All right, so, David, now now I recommend everyone goes to Universe Today on the homepage right now. There are the 101 astronomical events for 2014. But, David, yeah. give us some, some I mean, highlights. What is What I, are going to be some big events I, that are going to be happening uh, in 2014? Out of, out of, the, out of those 101, um, I would distill it down. There are four eclipses next year. We're not having a total lunar or a total solar eclipse next year. Ironically, in 2014, is uh, we're having the minimal number of eclipses that can occur in a year, which is four, which are two lunar and two solar. Both the solars are uh, an annular and a partial. But we're having two lunar eclipses, probably the best one, one of the best events coming up in April 15th, right on U.S. Tax Day. We're having a total lunar eclipse that's going to be visible from North America. And we're having another total lunar eclipse visible on October 8th that will be visible from most of North America as well. So we're getting two lunar eclipses even though we're not getting any, we're getting a good partial solar eclipse 
on October 23rd that's going to be 81% partial over North America, so that's pretty decent. Uh, so we're going to have some really good conjunctions. Uh, Jupiter and Venus are going to be very close on August 18th. They're going to be 15 arc minutes apart, which is like a half the diameter of the full moon in the morning sky. And what's going to be kind of cool is the crescent moon on October 23rd is going to join them, so we're going to kind of get uh, a skewed smiley face eclipse, or uh, not eclipse, but a conjunction. We're going to get two stars, and the crescent moon kind of turns sideways, not quite in, the, in an emoticon kind of shape, unfortunately. We had one like that a few years ago. It's a but, drunk uh, that's emoticon. That's going to be pretty cool. In the, in a, pretty much. That'd be a cool one, cool thing to call it, actually. It's a drunk emoticon. <laughs> drunk emoticon. Uh, Aren't they all... <laughs> there, are, there are. There's going to be some good meteor showers. Um, unfortunately, the good dependable ones, like the Perseids and the Geminids, the moon is going to be interfering at that time when those peak. But the Quatrinids come on January 3rd, uh, coming right up next weekend, and those usually have a zenithal hourly rate of 100 or better. And the moon is just going to be past new, so that may be the best meteor shower of the year. Uh, if we don't get any of these spurious ones from Ison that people talk about, or there's another meteor shower from a comet 209p linear in on May 24th, that uh, there's some discussion that we may get a, a surreptitious meteor shower from that one. Uh, one of the more bizarre events that's happening next year, but it's going to pass right over New York City, is an occultation of a bright star by an asteroid that a lot of people are going to see. Uh, asteroid 163 Aragon is going to occult the star Regulus. So you'll be able to see this with the naked eye. Really? This is going to be on March 20th, on the, ver on the very early morning uh, hours of March 20th. There's already a web page dedicated to it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be bigger in the news as we get closer to it. We haven't had a naked eye star occulted by an asteroid. There, there's these kind of occultations are going on. There are hundreds of them every year, but most of them only advanced amateurs are going after them, and they happen in remote places. There was one by a star in Libra a few years ago that was third magnitude, but it was in Mali. Mali was undergoing uh, civil unrest at the time, and uh, there was no expeditions out to try to catch it, so nobody that I've heard of saw it. And, and what's cool about these events is because uh, asteroids are potato-shaped, different places are able to see uh, different length transits. Yes. And mm -hmm. this allows us to map out the shape of the asteroid by getting observers all along the transit line. A amateurs have discovered moons around asteroids just by seeing uh, extra wink outs when the star goes yeah. out. And so how long will it take? Like if we are if we live in New York, which one this, of us does, um, how long would we be watching? Right right along happen? the graze line, the maximum is 14 seconds. So it's not going to be long. So the star will just fade away yeah. for 14 seconds and come yeah. back. And then come yeah. back out. Yeah, that'd, and, and be, the, that'll be pretty neat. Wow. We need to try and do a live hangout about that. That would yeah. be kind of cool. And you probably could conceivably, uh, get, if somebody had the right kind of, I could image Regulus even with my system. Uh, of yeah. course, it's not going to happen here in Florida, but somebody could conceivably stream that. Um, we have a comet approaching Mars next year. Uh, there was a lot of, of uh, flurry around the Internet earlier this year when, a, when comet 2013A1 Siding Springs was discovered to come very close to Mars next year on October 19th. And there was even some discussion about it impacting, which it's uh, pretty much been ruled out now. But uh, we are definitely going to have, you'll be able to see this comet with binoculars. It'll be seventh magnitude next October, and it'll be kind of cool to see it next to Mars, about seven arc minutes away from Mars at that time. Mars and is reaching opposition next year, too. So. And, and its dust trail uh, could be picked up by MAVEN's instrumentation, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Maven is getting there just just in time. Uh, Maven in India's uh, Mars orbiter as well. So in Curiosity, there'll probably be a campaign to try to see it from the surface of Mars. And there's talk about possibly there might even be a meteor shower uh, connected with this uh, over Mars to be visible from Mars. So it's uh, we don't have any bright bright comets coming into the U.S. sky or into the skies in 2014, but there's that a few we binocular know of next year. So. <laughs> That we know of. There, there's always that possibility a good, another bright Hayukutaki could come out of nowhere. That would be kind of cool if it did. There, there's also a triple shadow transit on the cloud tops of Jupiter on June 3rd. We had one this year. Uh, Europe is going to get this one. Uh, so uh, that'll be kind of interesting. Those are, those are pretty rare. They're usually only once every few years you get a triple shadow transit. So. Uh, we're going to get some landings, some, some, I guess, or some, you know, uh, Maven should arrive at Mars. Ro it's not going to land, but Rosetta, 
Rosetta is going to deploy its lander toward. That'd probably be the big uh, encounter uh, of the of the year next, later in November. I'm, I'm they're, just reading up on that. They're waking Rosetta up on January 20th, and the European Space Agency is actually asking for people to submit videos telling Rosetta to wake up, and those will be selected off of their Facebook page on January oh, 20th. Cool. That is awesome. Wake up, Rosetta. Time to get up. Come on, buddy. Um, uh, yeah, and it's going to harpoon the comet, which is I think is great, because the gravity is so low, you can't really land on it, so it's going to yeah. harpoon it to hold on to it. I think this is... it's yeah. that's, That is the mission be first. Yeah, that yeah, I'm yeah. most excited. And yeah. that's, in, that's in November. It's going to start gearing up, so... Yeah. Anything else, David? in 2004. <laughs> um, know, that, that's it for it's... the top events. I mean, there's there's lots more going on. There's there's occultations of Saturn and occultations of Venus. Uh, Ceres and Vista are going to be very close to each other next year. And of course, all the big events. You know, we got further like uh, total solar eclipse in 2017, and those things coming further down the road. But yep. it's weird that 2017 almost seems like it's not that far away now. 2017. Oh, well, and... this, yeah. this is going to so... be a good one. So I think one of the things that we need to, to note here is the majority of the awesome stories that we've pointed out were related to space exploration and planetary science. The things that we're most looking forward to are generally related to planetary science. I'm an astrophysicist. I'm biased away from planetary. But yeah. this is where the big discoveries are happening right now, and that's where the government is doing funding cuts. So there's something mm -hmm. screwed up with our priorities right now as a country. Um, and, and I say that as an individual speaking from my spare bedroom, not as someone who works with NASA. So as an individual, I'd like to point out that the coolest science we're seeing comes from planetary, and we need to invest in keeping these discoveries going into the future. I think what's amazing about this list that you put together, Dave, is this is just the stuff that we can predict. Yes. I mean, when you yeah. look at the list of stuff that we thought was big and important for the last year, really only half of those things we could have predicted. The other yeah, half were total the, surprises. Th this is all observational astronomy drawn from about two dozen different sources that I'm looking at daily. And what I like is I now have 101 stories to write for Universe Today next year. So. <laughs> great, I'll, I'll, great. I'll get my pocketbook open. It, that's, I've done this for a few years on my own site, and this this gives me the the research material to just start pulling down each week, yeah. writing about different astronomy uh, events that are going to happen. So, all right, that sounds great. Cool. Well, I think uh, well, why don't we wrap this up? Uh, so. Hey, thanks to everybody for watching and supporting us over the course of this last year. We really appreciate it. It's uh, It's been great to see a lot of familiar names and a lot of new names, and, and I know you sort of worked through all of our technical issues. We've tried to sort of keep the, the Hangout going. I, I want a big thanks to Nicole Gallucci, who's been the producer yes. for the Weekly Space Hangout. She wasn't able to make it this week, but she, you know, is often here and uh, has really been the backbone of this whole e effort and has been sort of herding the cats and and sort of keeping the energy level high and, and commenting with all the people while the shows are going on. She's absolutely critical and it's been a real pleasure to have her helping us out. And also to to uh, Susan Murph who joined the Universe Today team uh, a couple of months ago and has been really helping me stay organized and, uh, and get all of the, the stuff happening that we're, we're doing. So um, a few people behind the scenes. But uh, hey, and thanks to thanks to the people who showed up today. We really appreciate it. It's great. You know, we never know who's going to show up, except David. David always shows up. But <laughs> we, we don't know who's going to be here, and it's always a, a treat to see when people are able to make it. I know Brian, you've you know you've got a break from your classes, so it's a it's a rare event. I guess till the summer. Yeah. Well, hope, hopefully, I won't have uh, classes scheduled during this time in spring term. I don't know my schedule yet, but. Great. So, Brian, where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can find me on Google+, Plus, like at Daily Posts, and then uh, also on Twitter. It's at Brian Coverline. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, you are blogging every day. You are literally running your own space news website through Google+. And so every day you're, you're either reporting That's something cool. interesting or you're explaining some concept in space and astronomy, and your, your posts are just terrific. I'm often... You know, directing people your way. So please Thank keep that up. We really appreciate it. Uh, David, where do we find out more? Uh, see, this week I was active on my own site, Astrogaz with the Z. 
Listasaur, Canada.com, and Universe Today, and I'm writing a big post on the Quadrinid Meteors. will probably be the very first event post of 2014 that I'll be covering next week for Universe Today. Oh, great. Pamela, where do we find out more? Uh, professionally, you can find me at astronomycast.com, at cosmoquest.org, and I speak my own mind at starstrider.com and as Starstrider on Twitter. And, of course, I am the publisher of Universe Today, and uh, we just posted an interview that we had with Dr. Ian O'Neill when we met with him down at the, uh, the YouTube L Space LA, so you can find that on the Universe Today channel. And we actually just posted our 62nd Space Explainer video for the year. For the year. So the goal is we're putting out two a week, and so far we've been, been sticking to our schedule. So we've got lots more coming uh, into the new year. So And we thanks. will have Astronomy Cast coming on Monday as yes. the next Hangout. Oh, cool. Yep. Uh, yep. The next astronomy cast. It's going to be part two of building telescopes, where we go into the serious business of, of building telescopes, as opposed to the toys and kits, which we handled last week. Uh, one other thing is that our good friends over at Deep Astronomy, Tony Darnell and uh, and team, are going to be uh, doing a very similar year in review wrap up uh, for their for their channel. And that's going to be a live hangout. And that's starting at five o'clock. And so definitely go take a look for. Uh, the Deep Astronomy channel, and uh, and I may be showing up for that. So, uh, yeah. thank thank thanks guys for helping me get my ideas straight for for the next hangout. So so once again, thanks to everyone for watching. You know, for 2013, we really appreciate it, and we look forward to bringing you more space news and information into 2014. We really seriously could not do this without all of you and your support, and uh, we really appreciate it. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you all next year. Yeah. <laughs>